فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم If you know there's a person who has a beautiful recitation of the Quran, it's recommended that you say to that person, can you read for us? And you request for them to read the Quran because their recitation will affect. But if the person whose recit recit recitation is not uh, good, then remember they may cause others to not be focused. Among the pious predecessors were those who would, res who would request for men of beautiful voices to recite the Qur'an while, while them themselves, why they themselves listened. So sometimes the Salaf would say, can you read Qur'an for us so we can listen to your recitation? That's permissible. Because of the voice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you, let's listen to your recitation. Can you read for us? So we can ponder on the Qur'an and feel the Qur'an, then this is good. It is agreed that this is something recommended, and it is also requested among the pious and, and the devout worshippers of Allah. So this is something which is, he says, هَذَا مُتَفَقٌ عَلَى اسْتِحْبَابِ This is by consent that it is recommended. And this is the عادة الأخيار والمتعبدين وعباد الله الصالحين. This was the norms of who? The righteous ones, slaves of Allah, the noble individuals. This is what they used to do. وهو سنة ثابتة عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. And it's a sunnah transmitted from who? The Messenger Ali Al-Bukhari narrates that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud narrated that Allah Almighty said, Whoever is Recite to me, I said, O Messenger of Allah, shall I recite to you when it is upon you that that it the Quran was revealed? He said, I like to hear it from others. And so I recited Surah Al Nisa until I reached this verse. How will it be then when we shall bring from each nation a witness and bring you, O Muhammad, as a witness upon this people? He, the Prophet, then said, That is enough. And then when I turned to him, I could see that he, tears were flowing from his eyes. The Prophet ﷺ said to, so this is the evidence from the Prophet, that you can ask somebody to read the Qur'an for you. That the Prophet ﷺ said to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said to him, اقرأ علي القرآن, read the Qur'an on me. فقلت يا رسول الله, he said, O Messenger of Allah, اقرأ عليك وعليك أنزل. Am I going to read the Qur'an on you? And when the Qur'an came down on you, like the Qur'an came on you, so shall I read on you? And this shows you that the humbleness of the Prophet ﷺ, he taught the companions the Qur'an and how to read the Qur'an. But ma'a thalika, he wanted to hear their recitation. He liked Abdullah ibn Mas'ud's recitation. And the scholars, they took a chapter for the, from the, for this in Mustalah al-Hadith, which is called Riwayat al-Akabir an al asagir This is where that chapter comes from. That a stu teacher narrated from his student. That, that there's a chapter in hadith which that a person who is high can take from a person who is low. He can. So he, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Inni uhibbu an asma'ahu min ghayri. I love to hear it from other than myself. Then uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud started Surah Al-Nisa. He started from the beginning. And he read, 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 until he came to the statement of Allah. فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا يَوْمَئِذِ يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَعَصَوُ الرَّسُولَ لَوْ تُسَوَّى بِهِمُ الْأَرْضَ وَلَا يَكْتُمُونَ اللَّهِ حَدِيثًا But he got to the ayah, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا When he came to that ayah, the Prophet said to him, حَسْبُك الآن. Sufficient, enough. Don't read anymore. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, فَالْتَفَتُّ إِلَيْهِ I looked at the Prophet. فَإِذَا هُوَ عَيْنَاهُ تَدْرِفَانِ His eyes were watering. Salawatullahi Allahi wa sallam was crying. The reason, is, the reason why he was crying is because the ayah was saying, فَإِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ If we come with every nation testifying, and we bring you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, testifying against them, they will testify against you, and you will testify against them. So they will be asked, did Muhammad convey the message to you? The fact that the people will be asked, and he knows he did, but he's still scared. Naam, so he cried alayhi salatu salam.
Ad-Darimi and others narrated, Ad-Darimi and others narrated with their chains that Umar ibn al-Khattab would say to Abu Musa al-Ashari, remind us of our Lord, upon which he, Abu Musa, would recite to them. Umar anhu, he used to say to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, Dhakirna Rabbana, remind us of our Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how would he remind them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He would remind them by reading the How would he do it? By reading the by reading the Quran. That's how he would remind them, hey? There are many other reports regarding this matter. Indeed, it is reported that some among the pious have actually died upon listening to the, recita to the recitations of the Qur'an. The, those whom they ask to recite, and Allah knows best. Here, we, some of them would ask a person to read, and they would listen, and because of the, 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 the way that they, the verses were, and the meaning of the verses and which they were listening to, it would affect them so much so, that some of them died listening. Some of them died listening. So this all shows that it's permissible to ask somebody to read the Qur'an for you. No. Especially if the person's got a good voice. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, the, right, the reason why Umar would ask him to read is because of his voice. His voice was very good. Mm -hmm. Some scholars recommend that study circles in which the Prophet ﷺ sunnah is being taught should be begun and ended with a recitation from someone with a beautiful voice. Some scholars, they said, ulama. Some scholars have liked, they like the idea that when a gathering is started, that verses of the Quran, uh, verses of the Quran be used. Like for example, when you come to some lectures, they say, let's open with Quran, inshallah ta'ala. And they open with verses of the Quran. Like for example, Jama' al-Islamiyya Medina, when the Mashayikh come, and they're doing a talk for these students. You always see some student comes up and he recites Quran for them. And then the lecture, it starts from there. So he said, وَقَدْ اسْتَحَبَّ بَعْضُ الْعُلَمَاءِ أَنْ يُسْتَفْتَحَ مَجْلِسَ حَدِيثَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ وَيُخْتَمَ بِقِرَاءَةِ قَارِئٍ حَسَنَ الصَّوْتِ But the person who's been tricked here is a person who's got a beautiful voice. مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ And he reads what he can from the Quran. Now Nawawi is going to mention, if you're that person who's got a good voice, and you're requested to go up and to do a what? Recite verses from the Quran that you shouldn't just recite any random place. That you should choose the most appropriate verses for that particular moment that you're being requested to re read for. Now he mentions them, ayah. And in such instances, it is important that the, that the reciter recite that which is appropriate for the purpose of the gathering. So whatever the purpose is, imagine you go to a nikah and they ask you to read. And you say, and you start talking about Jahannam. You're like, wow. Brother, this is a day where people are trying to enjoy themselves, getting married. Brothers start getting married. It's, it's a joyful day. And you talk about Jahannam. Huh? It's lack of hikmah. Yeah? Why are you there for? Stop. I don't know if you should stay there and read Quran and people. You could do so. You could. But in a wedding to bring Jahannam and, and mention it. That's something you enjoy doing. Oh, it wasn't me It's best that you do, what do you call it? What you do is you read. Huh? What's better is that you read ayat of marriage. وَمِنْ آيَاتِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَا آيَةً These are verses, you know, marriage and wife and spouses and Allah brings compassion between you guys. Are you there? Even then, when it's at a wedding, don't, don't, don't read the Qur'an for too long. Have another hikmah. Don't just keep going on and just going on and then the next page, turn over. It's not wise. Well, Idalik Abd Aziz ibn Abdullah ibn Baz, alayhi rahmatullah, they came to him. Allah, Sheikh ibn Baz was wise, wise, hikmah, hikmah. They came to him and they told him to do a little reminder in a wedding. What did they say to him? They told him, Sheikh, do a reminder in the wedding. And then the Sheikh realized, because it's a wedding, people come for eating, enjoying themselves. Sheikh just said, invite me when the aqiq is happening. Just invite me in the aqiq. And he left. You know what the is? When a baby comes, and, you know, 
and you, the cares kind and your little gathering might happen, just invite me then. And he left. He said, I want to do no talk. It's not, it's not the right place. It's not the right place for it. Okay? If it's a gathering pertaining to, for example, youths, youngsters are coming here, then you, you, should, you should read verses what? How about maybe then Jahannam and Nar or whatnot? If people that you're dealing with in front of you are people of dunya, businessmen, then and they're dunyafied and there's too much in the dunya. You read these verses for them. Dunya is nothing. It's going to go. It's going to perish. This is all going to go, right? You get those verses of dunya for them. Are you with me? So you look at the position that you're in and you do that. Sisters in their own gatherings, can they do that for themselves? No. Within themselves, they can read, beautify their voices for each other. They choose the sister who has the best voice and they tell the other one sit back and they, they, they listen to her recitation. Okay? And she recites and reads for them and again, she observes the situation that she's in. Now. And that he recites verses that pertain to the fear of punishment and the hope of Allah's mercy. So look at the place. If the place is a place where you feel like these people are full of hope, Ayatul Khawf. If you feel like these people are already scared, they are on the brink of giving up in life, they're suicidal, you don't be ayat of Jahannam again. These people want to kill themselves. They already feel like they're sinners, they've done too much sins, Allah is not going to forgive them. You don't talk to them about nar and adab and throw them off. You give them hope. You give them hope, you bring the verses of hope that Allah loves you. Allah wants to take you to Jannah. Allah wants to forgive you for your sins. That's what you say to the people. Are you with me? Some people have given up in life. They've looked at themselves and they said, I'm a criminal, I'm a sinner, I, I don't know, I'm not going to go to Jannah, Allah is not going to have mercy upon me. It is not wise for you to bring the verses of adab to them. Lack of hikmah. You can bring them ayat of hope. Sah? Naam. Just as it is important that, he, that, that the verses he recites revolve around admonition, the forsaking of the God life, and enticement towards the hereafter, the, tempor the temporality of this world and the detriment of the man's and behavior. Mm -hmm. Section. So all of those are things that you need to observe. Whose who's, who's Quran are you, are you who's, sorry, which gathering are you, are you in? You need to observe that. If the reciter begins with his recitation from the middle of a chapter or stops at a point other than its end, it is important that he start at a point where the context will be clear and that he stop at a, at, stop at a point where the related verses also stop. Here the author talks about a mas'ala called al waqf al ibtida. This is one of the hardest things that people get wrong. al waqfu wal ibtida. It's a very strong chapter in the Quran where you stop. Some people they stop in bad places that the whole meaning goes deficient. The whole meaning goes different. It becomes a whole different meaning. So you're not allowed to stop in that particular place. If you do stop, and you pick up from it again, then what happens is that the ma'annan, the, the meaning actually changes fully. Now, He should therefore not allow, his not allow his recitation to be based on parts, or half parts, or one tenth of parts, as such points might be located in the middle of verses, and uh, that are related to each other. So you, 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 all of it is based on the relationship between the verses. Some people okay, now don't know the meaning of the Qur'an. So how can they overcome this problem? They listen to a very well-known Qari. And that's it. You memorize it the way he reads it. So you learn how to do the waqf and ibtida. But if you know the Qur'an, then what you need to do is, you need to observe that. Now, for example, he's going to give you so many examples here right now. Are you? The following are examples of verses that begin parts. Are you? Uh, I'm Samit. At the top, yeah, they tell you don't stop there. La, salla, qalla, huh? qalla, whatever it's called, salla. They tell you in the middle of the page, whatever it is, the good place. That's true, it tells you, no. In Surah Al Nisa, ayah 24, and Allah and all married women are forbidden unto you. Except, that, these are examples, okay? Are you? And all married women 
married women that are forbidden unto you, except those captives whom your right hand possesses. And in Surah to Yusuf, Ayah 56, and I do not absolve myself. Surah to An uh, Ayah 56, the response of his people was nothing other than that they said. In Surah uh, Al Ahzab, uh, Ayah 31, and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger among you. In Surah Yasin, Ayah 28, and we sent not against his people after him a host from the heaven. In Surah Fusilat, Ayah 47, to him alone the knowledge of the hour is referred. In, Ayah, in Surah Az Zumar, uh, Ayah 48, and the evil of that which they earned will become apparent to them. In Surah Al Dariyat, Ayah 31, he said, What is the purpose of your mission? O new messengers. In Surah Al Baqarah, uh, Ayah 203, and remember Allah in the appointed days. Finally, in Surah uh, the, the, the appointed days in the ayah is Ayyamu Tashriq Thalatha, the days of Tashriq, the three days, which is after the day of slaughter, Yom Al Nahri. Ayah. Finally, in Surah Al Imran, Ayah 15, say, Shall I throw my all of those are the examples of observing ibtida and al-waqf, where you stop and where you pick up from. Those are just examples that the author gave, rahimahullah ta'ala. Ayah? It is therefore not suitable to begin or end a recitation with these verses, as they are linked to the verses before them, and one should not be deceived by the numbers of reciters who do not take this into consideration. Pay attention to this qa'id that the no is going to give you. So pay attention. He tells you first of all, he says to you, do not as an individual stop or start here. Okay, good. Because the verses are connected. And what you're doing is you're disconnecting the verses. So you shouldn't do that. Then somebody, people, some people are going to be like, oh, but Sheikh so-and-so does it. But so-and-so does it. And this is a common thing that people do. Now he gives you a qa'ida. This concept you need to memorize. Which is, وَلَا تَغْتَرَّنَّ وَلَا تَغْتَرَّنَّ Never get deceived by the large amount of people who do something. Don't ever be fooled by the majority and say, oh, because the majority are doing it, it must be right. And you guys are more minority, so you're wrong. That's incorrect. The religion of Islam is not based upon number. The large amount are here, the small are here, so the large are right and the small are wrong. He's telling you here, don't get fooled by the majority. Don't. None. Should not be deceived by the numbers of reciters who do not take this into consideration and especially do not contemplate the meanings of what they are saying. And then he gives you who preceded him in this concept, this principle, which is not to be deceived by the majority. He says, <coughs> It is important that one take the advice narrated by Al Hakim Abu Abdullah with his chain of narration from the eminent Fudayl ibn, ibn Iyad. May Allah have mercy on him. Look what Fulayl ibn Iyad said, the great noble eminent scholar. Look what he said regarding this concept of following the majority because the majority are doing it. And since it's a lot of people who are doing this, it has to be right. Are you? He said, Do not feel lonely when upon the path of guidance because of the scarcity of those upon it. And do not be deceived into following the scores of those who are destined to be doomed. And do not be discouraged by the scarceness of those who strive towards their Lord Allah. Look what he said. La huda li qillati ahliha. He said, do not be. Find, don't find loneliness and feel like, oh, I'm alone by myself. In the path of guidance. Because the people who are with you are literally number. Don't. And never be deceived by thinking to yourself that you're upon the truth because the majority are with you. And one of the sad things that people will say today is that Islam is the truth. And you say, really? How so? And they'll say to you because it's the fastest growing religion. Really? Do you think Islam is the truth because it's the fastest growing religion? Do you guys believe that? I'm asking you a question. <coughs> if you ever connect your reason to something, you can't leave it later. Does that make sense? Are you with me, brothers? You guys have now said, or whoever says, that 
Islam is the truth because it's the fastest growing religion. Okay, so what about if time comes and Islam becomes the slowest growing religion? Are you going to say that Islam is wrong? I'm asking a question. So why are you using it in your favor when you want it and you're not using it now that it isn't? So no, no, no. Islam is right regardless of whether it's the fastest growing religion or whether it's not. It doesn't matter. It is the true religion. It's the true religion because of its arguments and its points. It's the true religion because of its evidences and the hujaj that it has come with. Not because it's the fastest growing religion or, or because 1.6 billion people in the world are Muslims. Sah? Are you with me? That's not the case. Okay? So we don't look at something based on numbers. This concept that this something is right because the majority are on it is incorrect. Sometimes the majority can be right and sometimes it can be wrong. But the majority of the times, the majority are wrong. The, over, the overall times, when you look at it, who is it the ones Allah praises subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran? Little of my slaves are very, that are the ones that express gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, If you follow the majority of the people, they would what? They will misguide you from the straight path. So never ever think to yourself that something is right and something is wrong based on number. Look at the proofs, look at the evidences, look at the arguments that are brought forward and base it on that whether it's right or wrong. Now. To this end, scholars have stated that it's better to recite a complete short chapter than to recite a part of a long chapter that is equivalent in length to the shorter chapter as the connection between the verses may at times not be noticed. Even he talks about a mas'ala which is that which one is better to read a short surah in its, com in its, complete, in, in its completeness completeness is it completeness or what? Yes. completeness can you say completeness and add, add that suffix to it? Yes. Zikari said yes okay. yeah? <laughs> double check William Shakespeare. Yeah, it's good. Is it right? No. Mm. Okay. Shakespeare says it. What can we say? إِذَا قَالَتْ حَذَامِيَ فَصَدِّقُهَا فَإِنَّا الْقَوْلَ بَخَرَا This is Zakaria. Allah barik. He's going to apply for Cambridge University. <coughs> so, is actually reciting the Quran Okay, so taking a surah and reading it all is better than taking part of a surah and reading portions of it here and there. So, that's what he's saying here right now. So, وَقَدْ رَوَى بِنَا بِدَاوُدِ بِسْنَادِ عَلَى عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بِنُ أَبِي الْهُدَيْلِ التَّابِعِيِّ الْمَعْرُوفِ رضي الله عنه That he said, كَانُوا يَكْرَهُونَ أَنْ يَقْرَأُوا بَعْضَ الْآيَاتِ وَيَتْرُكُوا بَعْضَهُ They used to dislike it, the Salaf. To read some verses and leave off the rest. So it's better that the person takes one surah and finishes it all, a small surah, instead of taking a big surah and picking and choosing part uh, of it. We'll stop there, inshallah ta'ala. Anyone have any questions? Anyone have any questions? So I'll conclude here, inshallah ta'ala. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله استغفرك وأتوب إليه